good to see you this morning. We are uh, wrapping up our October sermon series on gratitude, that our life is better when we live a life of thanks and appreciation and gratitude for all of the gifts around us. We celebrate those when our kids come forward. We celebrate that when we do a community event. Uh, there's so much around this congregation. This last week, um, the congregation held three celebrations of life for three amazing people, and, uh, and we're all part of this together. So I thank you for being part of that. Today, I'm thinking about the things that God asks us to do that are utterly impossible and how this scripture might speak to that. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the work that you've given to this church. And we ask as we open up our hearts and our minds that you continue to speak to us, continue to mold us and shape us and form us into the church and into the disciples that you with joy have created us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So friends, we've been talking about these three steps to gratitude uh, over the last month. And in the first week of October, we talked about finding contentment is that first step. We've gotta be okay with what we've got. If we're always drawn by this pull uh, that we need more, if we're drawn by this pull um, that we just don't have enough, if, uh, if we're always being pulled away to not be, ex not be thankful for what we have, uh, we can't be content with what we have. Uh, Philippians 4.11 says, I've learned to be content with whatever I have. Um, the world is always trying to make us feel like we aren't who we should be. Uh, but part of contentment is being thankful for where we are and what we have. The next week, we looked at giving thanks. And Psalm 92 says it's good to give thanks to the Lord. And there's many different ways that we do this. There's many different ways that we say thank you. One thing we talked about was prayer and how a prayer could be as simple as just saying thank you. And you offer that prayer throughout the day. As you walk throughout the day and you see something, you just say thank you. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big, long, wordy prayer. Just the word saying thank you. Another way is that thanks comes out of our life and we give thanks is through praise. And the things that we praise and the things that we lift up. And C.S. Lewis said that praise almost seems to be an inner health made audible. An inner health made audible in our praise. You know that person in your life that's always has a life of gratitude. They're always saying thank you. They're always seeing something and saying, that is just so wonderful. There's just something about their spirit. There's something about their health that is lifted up um, because they live a life of gratitude, of saying thanks. This Sunday is Commitment Sunday. This is the once a year time when we invite you to bring forward your estimate of giving cards uh, so that we can... Uh, support Christ through the work of First United Methodist Church. And, um, and so this is a perfect Sunday um, to look at our last uh, week, which is pass it on. Um, pass it on. That gratitude goes hand in hand with generosity. Gratitude and generosity. That we share what we've received from God. Winston Churchill gave us this quote. He said, we make a living by what we make, and we make a life by what we give. Our living is all these things we collect, but the life, the things that really make us who we are, is in how we give. So today, uh, Annie led us with the scripture from Matthew 28 of the Great Commission. These are the last words that we find in the book of Matthew, and it's given to us by Jesus, where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. The United Methodist Church captured this scripture years ago when they came up with their mission statement. So the mission statement of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Here's why I like our mission statement. Because it doesn't stop with us. It doesn't say the mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. 
because that's very focused on ourselves. It's very focused on the work that we do in here. Uh, to me, it sounds like we're just trying to get more members into the church. But the mission of our denomination is to go and to join God's work in changing the world and transforming the world. And the hurt and the needs in the world, we're going to play a part in that because who we are as a disciple is going to lead us and call us to use our hands and feet to go and to make disciples for the transformation of the world. Um, what we're about here is not about our own personal holiness. It's not about our own perfection. Uh, sometimes we would call that navel gazing. Um, just all oh, me, and, me and my perfect holy self, and that's what God wants. And I think, I think God wants us to take that and to go out and to go into the world, into all the nations, and to keep that work. So that's, that's our mission. One of the commentators I read this week, uh, Stephen Eason, he kind of names that this word disciple is kind of big and kind of broad. The word disciple can very quickly become churchy language. Um, disciple also kind of sounds like either you aren't a disciple or you are a disciple. Maybe you do something or you go somewhere and you become a disciple. He says that's kind of hard to figure out what it is then that Jesus is saying, I want you to go and make disciples. And what he suggests is instead of the word disciple, consider the word student. That student might be a better fit. Uh, that we want to be students of Jesus Christ. We want to be students of Jesus. So think about... Um, who we are when we're a student. When we're a student, we're in a lifelong learning journey. We're always working to become more. We're always working to follow Jesus more closely. And we want to practice this daily. Okay, becoming a person of faith isn't a decision that we made years ago and we're done, but it's something that happens every day. We try a little bit more. We try to learn a little bit more. Uh, we practice this daily. Students ask questions. Students ask questions. This may be a little, a little simple and basic, but did you know it's okay as a follower of Jesus to ask questions? It's okay to hear something and go, what about, wait, what, huh? Let's talk about that. I have a question about that. It is okay to have questions and to ask questions. It's also okay to make mistakes. It's okay to make lots of mistakes. Like, I actually want us to try to do so much around here that we make some mistakes from time to time. Um, I know I make mistakes. I made one six and a half years ago on a, let's see, it was a September 22nd, no. Um, student, do you like that word a little bit? Almost, I want you all to be students of Jesus Christ. I want you to ask questions. I want you to always need a teacher and a mentor and someone to guide you and to lead you. I want you to make mistakes and I want you to learn from them. Let's be students of Jesus Christ together. So I want to look at this scene of the Great Commission here at the end, um, Matthew 28. Uh, Thomas G. Long, another commentator, helps us better understand this scene that we have where Jesus makes this giant proclamation. Um, Jesus makes this giant proclamation, and I don't think what he's saying fits the scene. So let me explain. What Jesus says is huge. He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. This is a huge statement. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And you would think if Jesus were gonna make an announcement like this, that it would require a little more. It would require an audience of thousands. You know, the hillside is just filled with followers and people, so much so that they had to invent sound systems back in the day so that everybody could hear this proclamation all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. You would imagine that he probably need to be backed up by a, by a choir, maybe a choir that's got the hallelujah chorus ready and they're just like humming it, you know, boom, 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 dun, 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 then Jesus kind of comes out and goes, all authority and power in heaven. That would make a little bit more sense. This is the grand finale, friends. This is the end of the life of Jesus. He's beaten death. Jesus is resurrected. Jesus is calling the world to him. But that's not the scene. The scene is Jesus has gone back to Galilee. 
that means something. Galilee is where it all started. It's where this small, humble ministry started. Galilee is the backwater of the area. Are you familiar with that term, backwater? Backwater is like the town that's kind of out there, and there's just not a whole lot going on. If we were in this area, we might say Jesus should probably go to like the Austin state capitol and, and stand up on something high and make this grand proclamation to all of Austin. But Jesus didn't do that. He went out to, insert the name of your own favorite backwater local town. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. You're going to come up to me and say like, my mom's from that town. I'm going to go to the, another church now. That's what Jesus does. He takes these disciples, he goes to this unnamed mountain, and there's not thousands, there's 11, down from 12. And here's the line that we miss in this scripture, and it says a whole lot to who we are. The line says, they worshiped and they doubted. Jesus shows up, they worshiped, and they doubted. Some of the other uh, versions say they worshiped and some doubted. But here's 11, and not all of them are in on what's going on. They're still questioning and they're still doubting. And so what that tells me is that certainty is not a prerequisite for following Jesus. I need to hear that. And I bet some of us in here need to hear that too. That to have a call from Jesus to be Jesus' hands and feet in this community to show the love and the kindness and the grace, what, what we're trying to be about here is not started because we've got it all locked up and we've got it all figured out and we're absolutely certain. After all of this life, Jesus shows up in front of these 11 disciples and they worshiped and they doubted. And that's the scene. This group of 11 followers that still hadn't quite figured it out where Jesus says, you will go into the world. You, you will go to all the nations and you'll teach them what I've been teaching you. They worshiped, but some doubted. Jesus tells them, I want you to go gather up all of the people on earth and direct them to me. And that would be like standing up here on Sunday morning and saying, God has a word for us. It's to bring about world peace in the next month. So let's get to it. Um, it would be similar to going to a Bible study and saying, uh, God has called us to go and meet every need of every person in Georgetown, Texas. Go. Jesus comes to these 11 disciples and says, I want you to go into the world and make disciples of all nations and all people. I want you to point everybody to Jesus. So this commentator, Thomas Long, is saying... We need to note that what Jesus is asking them to do is utterly impossible. And maybe that's the point. Because Jesus follows up with the very last line of the book of Matthew and says, and remember, I'm with you always and to the very end of the age. Remember, I'm with you always. I will never leave your side. I'm with you always, even when what I've asked you to do seems utterly impossible. I'm with you always to the end of the age. This uh, commentator that I'm pulling from today has this great quote. It's a little long, so I asked him to put it on the screen. The work of the church cannot be taken up unless it's true that all authority 
does not belong to the church or its resources, but comes from God's wild investment of God in Jesus the Son and the willingness of the Son to be present always to the church in the Spirit. If at any point we think that this authority that we have to go and do what we're going to do as a church has to do with us, or because we've perfected some metric, we've perfected something, look out, because there's trouble. If you ever hear a pastor that presents and says, I have this authority and I have this guidance and I have this leading of what we're supposed to do out there, um, there's trouble coming. But this authority and this power comes wholly from Jesus because what we've been asked to do is utterly impossible without the Spirit and without Jesus. You see what he's trying to say? Jesus is telling these 11 that are still sticking around, and some of them don't even completely believe. They've got doubts and questions. And he says, I'm going to use you 11 to go and start this whole mission in the world. But remember, the Spirit, I will be with you always. Michael Slaughter, several years ago, coined this term called a God-sized dream. Uh, He said, basically, church, what you want to be doing, what your mission is, it needs to be something that you look at and you go, that is utterly impossible for us to do. You're going to have to have some God involved in there if that's what we're going to do. So if we're at a committee meeting or if you're in a small group and you're trying to figure out what you're going to do and you're thinking, boy, this is pretty easy. We can probably knock this out. A couple sign-up geniuses and we'll put that together and we're off to go. Um, Then maybe we're not done yet dreaming Um, because God calls disciples to do utterly impossible things. So today's Commitment Sunday, um, and before we come forward, uh, maybe we just name some of the impossible tasks, the utterly impossible tasks that are always in our community. Maybe an utterly impossible task is that you've been asked to mentor and to teach the youth in the church. And you need to hear that word that says, remember, I'm with you always. Maybe your calling is to forgive someone who's hurt you in your life. And that's an utterly impossible task. Without the voice of Jesus, remember, I'm with you always. Maybe as a church, we've been asked to provide financial resources to those in need in our community And we have all these programs, and we have ways that money is going out the door to help people in our community. And we know that sometimes people abuse that system. And sometimes people take advantage of us. But it's still something worth doing. And it looks impossible at times, and we hear that voice. Remember, I'm with you always. Maybe Bruce Schrote has pulled you aside and said, hey, I think you would be great at leading a Bible study. And you say, but Bruce, that's utterly impossible. (laughs) Maybe you've been working on a building committee for the last year, and the projects that we're beginning to think about and plan about and dream about are starting to come together, and we're starting to see 3D renderings, and we're starting to see the costs that are going to come with it, and maybe we're going, ah, we need to hear a voice that says, remember, I'm with you always. The church is going to be asked to do utterly impossible things. And we'll be in our best place to do those things from a place of gratitude and a place of thanks where we're content with what we have and we give thanks and we're willing to pass it on to not store up and to build uh, over and over but we've got to have a place in our life where we're letting it out I'm going to share something and later I'm going to decide I shouldn't have done that 
and I'm not going to do it across the street, but there's, uh, uh, there's a word for that, spiritual constipation. just going to let you have that. That's for you. <laughs> and I'm starting to think that's probably not how I wanted to end that sermon. <laughs> that's not in the books. Um, friends, all of this is a work we do together from a place of gratitude, from a place of appreciation and thanks of all the things that God has done for us. And we come together as one, as the body of Christ, to do utterly impossible things for God in this community. And when you know it, when you sense it, when you understand how God's love works, you can't help but pass it on. You can't help but push it forward to hand it off to the next generation to say, this is so good that I can't hang on to it myself. So that's our, um, that's our consideration today. Um, in a moment, I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to invite you or your family to come forward to um, kind of symbolically up towards the altar as you place your estimated giving card in the basket. And we're going to collect those for a couple more weeks if you forgot. And if you're new to the church, please know that we don't expect you yet to fill out a card. You're not to that place yet. You're still getting connected. You're still getting to know who's around here. And so please hear me say again, it is so okay um, that, that many of you are just going to remain seated. That's, that's part of who we are, part of the relationship building. And um, friends that are going to bring forward a card, whatever's on there, thank you. And, and thank you for honoring our work and being part of the work that we do together. It's our promise as a congregation to do our very best in stewarding those funds and to be our very best um, at spending them. And so we thank you for that consideration. Friends, let's pray for a moment, and then we're gonna invite you to stand up and, and come bring forward those cards. The band is gonna uh, lead us in a song while we do that. Uh, God, we thank you for all that you've given to us. For the places where we've seen something and said that's utterly impossible, and yet you found a way. And we thank you. Uh, we, we ask, uh, God, that we would live a life of incredible, incredible gratitude, knowing that you love us exactly where we are and who we are today and what we're doing, and lead us to be students who follow you, always ready to grow, always willing to grow. And God, it would be a joy to join you in the work that you're already doing in transforming this world. It's our prayer that all of this points towards you and to your spirit, that every bit of, every bit that we wanna hold on for ourselves and say, look what we did, this is who we are, um, God, allow us to let that go, that this is all um, you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.